Welcome to Bond University on iTunes U. Well, thank you very much. I was going to thank you uh, for having invited me down. I was going to start, until I got the microphone on me, I was going to start with a few minutes uh, lambasting the, the public university where I work and saying how much better it has to be here. But uh, since this is recorded, I might, uh, I might forego the little bit about the pervasive managerial bureaucracy that's otherwise known as the University of Queensland, um, where they tell us when to mark, how to mark, uh, how many students we're going to have, what sort of marking we have to do. It's just beyond belief. Um, but uh, I did write something in the last UQLJ, and I haven't got fired yet, so I feel good about that. Um, it was pretty vitriolic. Um, for my brief, Patrick just said to speak on human rights, and uh, he sort of left it at that. So uh, that gave me really two options. Um, one thing I could do is I could go down the route of undertaking a fairly specific uh, black letter critique of bills of rights. Uh, to be totally honest, um, it, I'm tired of that. Um, I'm a strong opponent of these instruments. I don't like them in their entrenched constitutionalized form that you see in the U US and Canada. I don't like them in the statutory form you see in the UK, New Zealand, uh, state of Victoria. The, the criticisms are uh, slightly different, but they both end up along the lines that they're just not very democratic instruments. Um, I sort of reject the sort of characterization that people who are against bills of rights don't want protection of human rights. It's how you go about doing it that matters. Um, so in my view, both those are pernicious. And I could just run through that. I, I, I went around the country with George Williams. We debated it. And uh, everyone thought we were going to get this statutory Bill of Rights nationally. And uh, I was as surprised as anyone when the government caved in. But there was lots of drinking at my house that night. I, I think it's now off the agenda for about 10 years. But we'll see. At any rate, if anyone's interested, this is sort of my take on the national one. And this is the UK one. Um, and if you don't want them, I'll just use them for kindling or something. But uh, so if anyone wants to ask questions on, say, the Victorian Charter of Rights and what's wrong with it, or the Section 32 reading down provision, or the declarations of inconsistent interpretation, I'm happy to field questions on that, or uh, the Human Rights Act in the UK, or the Canadian Charter of Rights. But I decided rather than do that here today, um, I'd go down the other um, route. So just take it as read that I think that bills of rights uh, just give too much decision-making power to point of application interpreters, um, judges, or as Jeremy Waldron continually calls them, committees of ex-lawyers, who, whose decision-making rule is a very procedural one. You count heads. So the decision-making rule in the Supreme Court is five votes beats four. It's true that they're all trying to make political moral arguments, but you know politicians do that too. Um, you can't have a Spike Lee-like rule that says do the right thing because people on different sides of abortion issue or asylum seekers or same-sex marriage, both sides think they're doing the right moral thing, the right human rights thing. And inevitably, you end up with a procedural rule. So I'm happy to field all those sorts of questions. Um, and you know, I've, I've, I, I, I've got a book coming out uh, in about two weeks, uh, which I should plug in Ashgate, called um, uh, The Vantage of Law. And it, deals largely with bills of rights and I had a debate with Kirby and stuff. So if anybody's interested in that, I'm happy to give you uh, sites or that. But I'm going to let that go. Um, I'm going to do what my other option was, um, which was to look at the question of what human rights are. And of course, your decision, your, your take on what a human right is or how you understand it might influence how you think it's best to protect them. So I think you can, you can take it that everyone wants to protect human rights. The real debate is, is a procedural one, how? What's the best way of doing it? Um, and that's where I sort of part company with people who think the best way of protecting human rights is to find a bunch of ex-lawyers who've been corporate lawyers for 10 years and appoint to the high court and let them decide. I don't think there's much empirical evidence for that actually doing much, but that's a question um, we can debate later. So what I want to do then is, is uh, talk about the idea of human rights. And uh, I thought the best way to approach the topic was a sort of indirect Alistair Cook-like way. So bear with me. I'll, I'll get back to the point in a second. But I'm going to serpentine around a bit first. So I think if you're going to think about human rights, the best thing to do is to start with the realization that people argue and they fight over concepts 
and terms. They, they fight over concepts, um, especially they fight over concepts that carry a big emotive or, or um, emotional punch. So if it's a notion or a term where you want the term on your side for rhetorical reasons, then people want that word on their side. Here's an example. Um, Take the phrase, uh, say, democracy or rule of law. You know, people use those concepts in very different ways, but they still both argue that they're on the side of democracy or they're on the side of the rule of law. And uh, there's a British philosopher, W.B. Galley, who wrote this great thing in the 1950s, short little thing called Essentially Contested Concepts. He's a philosopher. And you know, concepts like democracy or the rule of law, or I'm going to argue human rights, they are essentially contested concepts. They're, there are ideas where everyone wants the concept and says they're on the side of the concept, but they have different conceptions of that concept. So smart, nice, well-informed people, people you'd be happy to go for a drink with after you left the room, um, they just are going to disagree about these things. Um, so that's what I mean by an essentially contested concept. And as an aside then, and I think it's an important aside, Acknowledging the reality that there are differences of opinion and disagreement um, that are usually best characterized as uh, each side being well-intentioned, each side being intelligent and well-informed, that is not the most notable virtue of Bill of Rights proponents. No disrespect to anyone in the room, but often the default position, I've been to loads of these conferences, you know, the Bill of Rights conference, I'm no token skeptic, and it's like going to a Salvation Army revivalist meeting. Um, but you know, there's just so much self-satisfied, sanctimonious, moral certainty in the room, you can cut it with a knife. And it always seems to me that you know, it's just a mistake to assume the default position is that um, my first order moral preferences or my first order moral evaluations are somehow in some mysterious way that no one can ever explain self-evidently correct on asylum seekers, on same-sex marriage, on abortion, on all of the things that have ever come before the Canadian Supreme Court related to the Charter of Rights. And everyone who disagrees with me is somehow deficient. Maybe needs a bit of re-education, maybe really not up to it, a bit dumb, a bit subject to tyranny of the majority. You know, it's all the usual stuff. Um, so I think on all those sorts of issues, cross-examining rape complainants uh, in trials, uh, even recent ones like uh, shooting Osama bin Laden, um, every case that you can pretty much peg back to the Canadian Supreme Court or the, or the House of Lords on the Human Rights Act, um, it's a much better understanding, it's a much better characterization of what's really happening is that smart, nice people, people who have all of your virtues and intelligence, just disagree with you. Rather than thinking, you know, after four billion years of evolution, I'm the one. I've inherited these incredible uh, moral perspicacity or something. So a lot of proponents of human rights um, seem to somehow assume that the moral underlying moral philosophy issues are easy. And I don't think they are. I think the, the moral philosophy issues are very difficult. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole issue of, of moral realism versus uh, non-cognitivism, but you know, you'll do whole PhDs in moral philosophy on what sort of thing you're understanding when it comes to these moral disagreements. So that's the first point I'd make. If you're going to try to understand the sort of moral disagreements that usually get summed up in the phrase human rights, um, it's usually a fairly safe empirical generalization to say both sides of the argument are well-meaning, both sides of the argument are well-intentioned, <coughs> and they have the hope for making the society better. Not that one side somehow gets the stars and the other side are some part of a vast you know, conspiracy. Um, so I think people just disagree. It might be linked to their upbringing, circumstances, sentiments. Um, and what's relevant then for me today is that they disagree not just about first order issues, refugees, same-sex marriage, all the, all the sorts of things you see that come from the top courts, um, but they disagree about the meaning of concepts. Take this example. Let's, let's suppose you're someone who doesn't have much confidence in you know, the views of your fellow citizens. You're looking at the late, latest Canadian election. You go, oh, gee, and only 60% of people bothered to vote in this recent Canadian election. The Americans are usually below that, although with Obama, they, that election, they got a bit above it. Um, and you hear this all the time. Um, former Justice McHugh was recently sort of bewailing the, the sort of fact that 
to, you know, plumbers and secretaries and teachers just really, they're just maybe not as well informed as they ought to be on these issues. Um, let's suppose you think that. Um, now, not many people today can come out of the closet and say, look, I'm against democracy. Uh, you know, I don't really want to count everyone equal and then let the numbers count and they can elect people to decide these issues. It's a bit hard to admit that openly, but let's just suppose you're a latter-day aristocrat. So, you know, to put it bluntly, some people are in a better position to make these sorts of decisions than others. They're, you know, they've got a job on a UN Human Rights Committee or something like that. It's a bit hard to say that. So if you prefer judges and overseas you know, committee members of UN agencies to make these decisions, um, here's what you do. You just redefine the concept of democracy. So you take the core idea of democracy, which is related to um, how decisions ought to be made, and you stuff it full of moral abstractions. I did a piece in Law and Philosophy on this. So some people think of democracy in very procedural terms. It's really just majoritarianism, letting the numbers count. And that's the sort of older, more procedural understanding of it. But in the last 15, 20 years, especially coming out of Cambridge, um, there is this notion that democracy really is much more morally pregnant. So really to qualify with the tag democracy, um, it's not just anymore for these people how decisions are taken. It also includes some sort of judgment related to what those decisions were. So if they're not rights respecting enough or they're too illiberal, they don't really count as a democratic decision. Even though procedurally, you know, nobody pointed a gun at the head of the voters and just, you know, the Austrians just gave a lot of votes to some neo-fascist party or something. Whatever the decision is, there's sort of this what criterion. So now you get to assess how rights respecting some statute is passed by an elected legislature. And if it's unduly liberal, illiberal, it doesn't count as democratic. And you can see that the word democratic is often used that way these days. There's just two different senses in which the word's being used. But one sense really allows you to get everything you want without coming out of the closet and saying, hey, I'm an aristocrat. Now, there's a lot of American writers I really like who really just come out and say, I'm an aristocrat. Don't really trust the voters. I think that's honest. I think in some senses it's quite persuasive. Most people don't do that. They're too embarrassed. Um, but you know what you do if you take that road is you sort of finesse the fact that people disagree about rights respecting issues. I don't think you can point to a single Canadian Supreme Court case since the Charter came in in 1982 where one side is clearly sort of bonkers and they're wearing brown shirts and they have little brown mustaches and they're evil. I just don't think you can do it. I think almost every issue is a debatable moral issue. Um, and I say that, you know, having lots of first order views myself. Uh, and secondly, if you go down that route, then you have to concede that judges and international UN agency committee members are going to be making a lot of the calls that used to be made by voters. So it's a neat little trick. You just redefine the meaning of democracy. Um, it's now an essentially contested concept. Um, I could do the same thing with this idea of the rule of law. I mean, the rule of law used to be a very sort of, you know, Lawn Fuller had a very procedural understanding, general rules known in advance, able to be complied with. Um, it was a procedural thing. It's how you made rules. And sure, underlying that view of the rule of law, there is an assumption that if you force government to operate through rules that are prospective and able to be complied with, you might end up with better outcomes. But in no way did it foreclose bad legal outcomes. You know, you could follow all of the Fullerian procedural rule of law norms and standards and still get a poll tax, Thatcher. Or, you know, still get um, a U.S. Congress passing a law that rounds up all the Japanese Americans in World War II. The new concept, the newer concept of the rule of law, again, is much more morally pregnant. It's, you know, T Trevor Allen at Cambridge again, or in the uh, New Zealand Phil Joseph, where they they actually build in just about every moral good thing you've ever seen. And if you don't meet all those, you don't really count, it doesn't really count as a rule of law outcome. I think it's a problem. At any rate, whether you agree with me or not on those two examples, let's now turn to the idea of human rights because um, I think the notion of human rights doesn't define itself. Everybody uses the term, but it doesn't define itself. It's an essentially contested concept. People disagree about what it will and uh, sorry, what will and won't fall under its aegis. It's a very broad, abstract notion. And uh, they do that just as they're going to, um, just as they disagree about, say, more particular claims. The right to free speech. Um, the right to fr fair trial, say. So when I traveled around Australia debating bills of rights, you know, I'd almost always start by 
getting the audience and I'd say, so who's in favor of the right to free speech? Or who's in favor of the right to a fair trial? I never had anyone in, well, it must have been 40 of these things, I never had a single person not put up his or her hand. Um, in Adelaide once, I was told beforehand that uh, quite a well-known uh, Holocaust denier was in the room. He put up his hand as being in favor of free speech. Um, I, you know, I waited for the day that a guy in a brown shirt and a little mustache would come in and not put his hand up, but it never came. So that tells you something about the language of human rights. Everyone's in favor of it. You can't deny that it's at such a high level of Olympian abstraction that everyone's in favor of the right to free speech or everyone's in favor of uh, a fair trial. But when you start saying, okay, but that's not how they operate. Nobody in Canada goes to the Supreme Court and says, I, you know, I want to litigate to uh, end free speech as we know it. And it never happens. You get very subtle arguments about where you draw public policy lines. Um, you know, and for 15 years in Canada, um, the Canadian Supreme Court decided that you could effectively put tobacco advertising on billboards near primary schools. Five to four decision. How many people thought that's what they're putting their hand up for, for free speech? Highly debatable call. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. Or, you know, you look at free speech, instead of talking about it in the abstract, you might say, well, you know, what kind of rules do you want that limit campaign finance? You know, how many, do you want billionaires to be able to spend all their own money to influence elections? And a lot of people say no. Um, or, uh, you know, how, how do you want to change your defamation regime? Or, you know, if you go to a fair trial, everyone's in favor of the right to fair trial. But I'm willing to bet an awful lot of people in this room if I said, do you think it would be okay to bring in a legislative regime that put a few limits on how you cross-examine rape complainants? So instead of wide open cross-examination, you put a few limits on asking rape complainants, people, women who are alleging they've been raped, about their past sexual history. A lot of people would say yes, right? The British uh, Parliament passed legislation effectively along those lines, and the House of Lords said that's a breach of the right to fair trial. Did you know you were putting your hand up for that? See, these are abstractions that, that basically cover what are very contestable moral line drawing calls. Um, so up in the Olympian heights of moral abstractions, where you just talk about things like the right to free speech, the right to freedom of religion, you know, you, you finesse disagreement, you gloss over disagreement. And so what Bill of Rights proponents tend to do is they tend to stand up and say, don't you want your rights protected? Again and again. And of course, the answer to that is yes, of course I want my rights protected. But people disagree about what the rights respecting answer is. And what we really need to argue about is the right procedure for trying to do that, knowing going in that we live in a world where people are not always going to agree. You can't seriously expect to be on the winning side of every line drawing rights related or any political issue. You can't seriously think I'm going to be on the winning side of every issue unless you're Robert Mugabe. Because the fact is you're going to win some and lose some. And in a world where you're going to win some and lose some, one thing that's important is what do you do if you lose? And in a system where the politicians make the line drawing calls, your remedy is to work for a party that's going to change it. But in the US, if you're on the side of saying that abortion is, a fact, is effectively murder of a fetus, that's a respectable argument. I'm not, a, I'm not remotely religious, but it's a respectable argument. And in the US, you have no remedy. You basically shut out the 40, 50, 60 percent of Americans who think that. Their only remedy is to try to lobby for the appropriate Supreme Court judge to be appointed by the next president. And you wouldn't believe what percentage of Americans tell pollsters that they vote for president based on who's going to be appointed to the Supreme Court. But there's something wrong with that, in my view. There's something wrong with telling people, you know, we're just going to shut your moral view on abortion out. And I travel around with a lot of these people who sort of are these neo Hobbesian public choice theorists who take the most cynical view of politicians imaginable. And then the minute you start talking about judges, it's just, it just ends. They become these, like, as if, as if all cynicism is washed away. And I'm actually not cynical about judges or politicians that much. But I think if you're going to assume that politicians are only out for their own immediate self-interest and everything's related to their likelihood of getting reelected, then you sort of have to apply the same sort of thinking to judges. And, make, and you have to assume that everything they do is related to their own immediate self-interest and what kind of publicity they're going to get and you know whether they're going to get nice little Twitter messages from GetUp from their latest decision in Roach or whatever. I mean, I don't think that's actually right. But I think to some extent, if you're going to be a fanatical public choice cynic, you can't just turn it on and off. And you see that a lot. So up in the Olympian Heights, I'd say, of moral abstractions, you can achieve near universal agreement in a nice Western democracy. You can't the minute you talk about any specifics. You just can't.
And so really, that means the language of human rights can achieve this sort of bogus consensus. And it does that by dealing in moral abstractions that are so abstract, and they're so couched in morally appealing connotations and generalizations, that just about everyone can sign up to them. As long as you don't ask for any details at all, you can sign up to them. I mean, that's the power of the language of human rights. But as I said, underneath that finessing set of abstractions, you just have to realize that what actions are and are not on the side of human rights is not something that defines itself. Just because someone says, I belong to Amnesty International, I was giving a talk there last night, it doesn't mean that you know, their view is somehow right just because they paid a subscription to Amnesty International. It's contestable and it's contested every day, all the time. So um, being on the side of human rights doesn't necessarily uh, sort of mean that your views are right and the other persons are wrong. They think they're on the side of human rights too. So I'd say one of the great tricks of those who campaign for a Bill of Rights then is to just stand up and say, don't you want your rights protected? Because that's effectively what the 90% of them do. Um, as if Australians, and this is actually a true fact, as if Australians today don't have more scope to speak their minds on issues related to hate speech, um, campaign finance rules, defamation than Canadians do. Canada has one of the most potent bills of rights in the democratic world. And actually, what you can say is more here in Australia on all three of those things. So the Bill of Rights, if, you, if, you, if the right to free speech means to you, I have more scope to speak my mind, well, you have more here without a Bill of Rights. Um, you don't ever hear that from Bill of Rights advocates. And as if in any political system known to man, you know, you're going to always be on the winning side. As I said, you're just not going to be on the winning side. Um, that point about uh, cross-examining ra rape complainants, that was the... That was the case of RNA. And you know, there's a certain assumption, and I think to a large extent it might be empirically true, but there's a certain assumption that if it's just down to politics, you're likely to get a more left-wing progressive um, decision out of the judges than you are out of the legislature. And of course, you have to realize that if that's true, and it might be in some jurisdictions, it's a contingent claim. So uh, it might be true under some courts with some things. But it's hard to say the American Supreme Court's more progressive than the Obama administration. It's not true. Or under than the Clinton administration, not true. Um, and even with, I, I like to use that RNA case because it's a bit of a shock to people to realize that the British House of Lords basically said you can't have that legislation that allows a loosening of or a restricting of what you can um, ask rape complainants because it's a breach of the right to fair trial. And I think that's a pretty debatable call. I think there's arguments on both sides, but I don't think that there's any reason people who say, I like, I think there should be a few more restrictions on cross-examining rape complainants are somehow against human rights. You know, it's a three to two decision. If one judge dies on the way to court, does that mean your timeless fundamental rights have flipped? It just seems bizarre to me. So I just think it's a debatable call. And um, the real issue then is just what institution do you want making these decisions? Do you want it to be the elected parliament or the unelected judiciary? Because really, when you're asking people to buy a Bill of Rights, you inevitably are asking for more decision-making power in the judges. George Williams and Frank Brennan don't spend 10 years of their life campaigning for these because they think they're going to make no decision, no difference at all. You know, it's so implausible when they go, oh, well, a statutory Bill of Rights isn't going to do anything. It could do anything. Why are you working so hard and so putting so much time into getting one in? Um, it's pretty clear it's done something in the UK, and it's pretty clear it's done something in New Zealand. Um, so really, the, it's just an empirical call in my view. I'm a sort of consequentialist. Which one has the best hit rate over time? Which institution delivers the goods? That's all that matters. Um, so you know, my view is the least bad option. I'm a bit of a Churchillian. I don't say democracy is perfect. I get sort of caricatured sometimes. I mean, there's lots of faults with representative democracy. There's no doubt about it. Loads. We could sit around for a day talking about them. But that's not the test. The test is something mm -hmm. better. Churchill had this famous quote. He said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for everything else, or everything else ever tried. And you know, that's a very different view. So democracy, I think, is the least bad option on the table. It's not perfect. It's not unfailing. Sure, there's lots of statutes we don't like. You might think it's too hard on um, terrorists in some instances. Though, of course, you have to realize that in Australia, after 9-11, uh, what did we get to? I think you could be held before charge here for up to seven days, I think it got to. The UK, with their Human Rights Act, it got to 28 days. Gee, you know? That, the one with the Bill of Rights is four times as long you could be held. And if you look at control orders, we look better than the UK, not in everything. 
Um, so you know, those are things you, you have to at least think about. Um, so we all want our rights protected, but you know, you and I and he and she and that group over there, we all agree about what the best course of action is to protect rights. You, you just can't assume, I don't think, that your take on whether prisoners ought to be able to vote. You know, like the High Court just, in my view, and Roach just made up this rule that three years is OK, but less than, came out of nowhere. Nobody can say that's constitutional interpretation, in my view. It's just making it up. Um, and I actually like the outcome. It's like the implied rights cases here in Australia. I like, I like the outcome. I'm a big free speech guy. But I can't read the implied rights cases without thinking this is just dishonest interpretation, or at least incredibly unconvincing interpretation of the Constitution. So, um, you know, it's, there's no reason I can see to think that a legal training, and you know, it's hard to tell lawyers this, but having a training in law doesn't really give you any expertise in more, it doesn't give you any better moral sensibilities. It doesn't give you a pipeline to God on same sex marriage or euthanasia. Um, you know, lawyers are good at law. They're not particularly good at morality, or they're no better than anyone else in morality. So it's not, you don't resolve these issues by shouting the loudest, I don't think. Or you don't say, look, I'm on the side of human rights. Um, you know, there's, and here's the other thing about morality. Uh, when the moral realist disagrees with the non cognitivist or moral skeptic, there's no way to resolve their disagreements. So not only is it true that people can disagree about the moral rightness of same-sex marriage or um, abortion or um, you know where to draw the line when you're balancing uh, need to call a lawyer against getting drunk drivers off the road, not only that they don't they can't even resolve the disagreement about the status of moral evaluations, which is a second-order issue. So when someone says uh, you know bear baiting is wrong. Has that claim got some sort of timeless, higher, natural law-like status to it, or is it just a function of human sentiments? You know, you go back to Kant and Hume, you go back, and the people disagree on that, and there's no way to resolve that disagreement either. So moral disagreements are very different from empirical disagreements. If you run into a, a sort of, if you have the bad luck of running into some sort of anti-foundationalist, uh, deconstructionist, postmodernist English professor, who says, you know, and they, some of them actually have said this, that you know, gravity is a social construct, <laughs> bizarrely enough. Um, there's a way to resolve that. You just take them up to your eighth floor window, you open the window, you say, go ahead. <laughs> and they never jump. They never jump because they don't really, they know that it's not true. They know there are mind independent, external causal restraint constraints. It's not just a function of men having oppressed women for a million years or the rich oppressing the poor. It's just a fact. You can't do anything about gravity. But when it comes to moral evaluation, you haven't got that. You know, there's a reason why science is so powerful. You have a double-blind drug trial, and it's independent of what you think. The answer, there's a reason why uh, antibiotics work, and it's not because you think they're working. Um, and so it's a bit different with morality, and there's no real way to, to um, resolve those sorts of issues. So you've got big problems on the morality front. And, uh, I think once you realize that in any Bill of Rights scenario, whether you're talking about an ability to strike down or invalidate legislation, as in Canada or the US, or an ability where the tools of the judge change under a statutory Bill of Rights to effectively this, with a statutory Bill of Rights, the tools the judges have, they're not allowed to strike down legislation, but they're always given a, what I call a reading down provision. So um, section 32 in Victoria or, or um, Section 3 in the UK or Section 6 in New Zealand effectively say to the judges, do everything you possibly can to read all other statutes as consistent with the enumerated rights, which is another way of saying with what you think is the rights respecting outcome. And then the big question is, well, how far will they go? And you don't really know going in how far they're going to go. In New Zealand, they didn't go too far, although they went too far for me. Um, in the UK, in a case called Guiden, it's just you can't even you can't even caricature how far they went. You can't even satirize it because the House of Lords said you can read words in, you can read words out. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but if you want the quotes in one of these, you can read words in, you can read words out. Um, you can ignore the clear intention of Parliament. You can go right up to the point of judicial vandalize, uh, vandalism, all in the name of create, reading that other statute as a rights respecting statute. In other words, you can legislate from the bench. It couldn't be any clearer. Um, and that's been affirmed and affirmed and affirmed and affirmed in the UK um, to the point where a top um, Oxford constitutional uh, 
legal academic now says, Eileen Kavanaugh, she says in her book and everywhere else, the UK House of, uh, the UK's Human Rights Act is every bit as potent as the American Bill of Rights. It's a statutory Bill of Rights. Now, I agree with her about that, although she likes the Human Rights Act and I, I don't, but I, I think she's right on, if, if you can start rewriting legislation, I, I think I prefer the American approach, because it's honest. Everyone can see that you're striking down the law, and the UK, they just change the meaning. Uh, the, all the rule of law values go out the window. It's sort of bizarre. You don't even know what a statute means until you've heard what the judges say it means. So I think all that's a problem. Um, so what I want to do now then briefly is I want to retreat a bit and just say a word or two about rights themselves. Because not only is the concept of human rights very amorphous and debatable, you know, up at UQ I teach the jurisprudence course or half of it. And you know, you have some pretty bright students coming out of high school and they come into the class. And you say to them, OK, so uh, anybody talk about rights in the last three years of law school? Oh, yes, yes, yes. OK, what is a right? And you know, they struggle to answer. They don't have any, they can't really give you. If you're really pushed, they'll eventually come up and say, well, their entitlements, their protections, their guarantees. But they have a real hard time. And you will never get a student who says, look, analytically speaking, a right amounts to another's must claim, which it does. You know, if you have a right, that means other, others must. You have the right to free speech. Others must let you speak. It's just straight analytical, boring jurisprudence. Starts with Hofeld. It's sort of you know, a claim right. Other people must let me speak, right to free speech. Um, other people must let me practice the following elements of my, my religion, right to freedom of religion. It's an others must claim. And you know, connected to every other's must claim is an I must. So if someone has a right, someone else has a duty. If I have the right to free speech, someone else has a duty to let me speak. You know, it's, that doesn't tell you anything about where the rights come from, but it lets you know that there's this correlative relationship between them. And that gives you a bit of insight, because you soon realize that any right is a rule. If there's a right to free speech, then there's a rule. You give me any right that you like, any right in existence in the world, and I can translate it into a rule. She has the right to free speech. There is a rule that says that in the following circumstances, she can say whatever she wants. Now, there is a difference, because the language of rights is very emotively appealing. You get this nice little thing down your tingle down your back. The language of rules really doesn't do it. right? It hasn't got the same oomph, but they're really the same. You know, it's any half-decent uh, legal philosopher will tell you that a right is a rule. They're the same thing. So. Why does that matter? Because we still don't know where these rights or these rules come from. Well, it matters uh, in this sense. Um, there are two kinds of rules in play or rights in play. You've got legal rights or legal rules. And those are the sorts of rules where you can see what the source is. You might not like the actual right or rule. You might disagree with it. But if it's a legal right, then you can point to a statute you can point to a series of judicial decisions. You can point to some constitutional provision that the judges have um, sort of made more specific. And you can say, that's where my right comes from. Those are legal rights. When someone says to you, look, uh, you know, people have the right to free speech in China, they're clearly not making a legal claim, right? There is no legal rule that people have the right to free speech in China. You know, Bentham made this point 200 years ago. That is a moral claim. So in that sense, it's a moral rule. You're announcing that wouldn't it be good if we lived in a world where people in China you know, didn't get run over by tanks for speaking their mind or didn't get sent off to psychiatric wards or whatever. Um, it's a moral claim. And what the language of human rights does is it takes that divide between legal rights, where they're enforceable, you can see them, and moral rights, where not only um, you know. Where, where you've got two sorts of uncertainty. First, you've got the uncertainty that not everyone's going to agree with your moral claim. Not everyone thinks you ought to have the right to free speech in China. People in this room might, but a lot of people in China wouldn't. Um, or you, know, you can come down to, to something more specific like uh, the right to a fair trial. And if you move it into the realm of ought you, in a moral sense, to be able to cross-examine rape complaints, well, a lot of people disagree on that issue. And what a what the language of human rights does, and especially in when, when it uses the, the vehicle of a Bill of Rights, is that it, it conflates or it concatenates the legal rights with the moral rights. So in a way, you can think of a Bill of Rights as partly enumerating legal rules, but also leaving the prospect that they can be inflated or ratcheted up over time to encompass ever more 
uh, moral rules through the back door by the judges. And so to some extent, uh, uh, the language of human rights is, uh, is talking both about legal rights and non-legal rights, or moral rights. And uh, I think it's pretty plain that over time you would expect things to expand. But um, so that's another thing I think that's going on. You've got the issue of, and you, know, you can see this in other ways. You, you, if you look at the end of the Second World War, there were two jurisdictions in the democratic world that had bills of rights, the US and France. France's was older, by the way. The American Bill of Rights is not the oldest. The French Declaration of the Rights of Man is. Um, so when your parents were born, or certainly your grandparents, or you know, people alive today, there were only two bills of rights in the democratic world. 60 years later, Australia is really the only democracy without one. You can argue about Israel, their basic laws. But OK, at most two, but probably only one. Now, that's happened in six decades. And a lot of people, you, if you wanted to characterize the last 60 years of you know, democratic constitutional law in the world, you'd say the triumph of American constitutionalism. It's winning everywhere. You have this notion of uber powerful judges who interpret a set of moral abstractions that are couched in terms everyone agrees to, but they end up making all sorts of um, debatable moral calls. Got it in Canada, got it in the UK, now got it in New Zealand. It's true that in France, until last year, two years ago, you couldn't actually go to court. So the, the French Declaration of Rights of Men wasn't justiciable. I don't actually mind that. It was just an aspirational document. It could be triggered by the losing political party if they got more than a third of the seats. That was quite a better way of doing it. But it, you couldn't actually, as an individual, go to court and overturn laws. They've changed that in the last year and a half. So even the French are following the American route. At any rate, if we go back to understanding um, this correlative understanding of rights, um, you can see that rights are related to duties, and they both are able to be expressed as rules. And one of the reasons I think the Victorian Charter was labeled the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities is the, the drafters recognized that right, you know, rights are correlated to duties. You can actually read the Victorian Charter. You won't see any responsibilities. It's like the Victorian Charter of Rights and Invisible Responsibilities. But it's obviously something they wanted to say. Um, but so, so I think that's going on, too. Um, How much time have I got left? OK, so um, maybe I'll just skip ahead. OK, we're all on just. Yeah, yeah, I finished. I'm sorry. Um, OK, look. Let me just skip ahead then to say um, a lot of the things that Bentham said a couple hundred years ago are now outdated. But one of the things he said is it's, it's very worthwhile to keep separate in your mind rights-based claims that are legal and enforceable, whether you like them or not, you know, whether you like the existing rules on tenants' rights, you know what they are, you can look them up, there might be small areas of doubt, but you know what they are, those are legal rights, and what are effectively moral claims about how the world ought to be. And now Bentham was, there's no way to characterize Bentham other than as a man of the left. He was one of the most successful reformers ever. You know, Bentham is in a direct line to the John Howard Society, to homosexual rights, to animal rights, you name it. But he had a pathological dislike of natural law thinking and of bills of rights. In fact, one of the best things, he's not a very good writer, but one of the best things Bentham wrote was when he went through the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, and he just took it apart, clause by clause. So you know, it starts, uh, all men are created equal. And Bentham, I paraphrase, basically goes, all men are created equal. The illegitimate daughter of my charlady is born equal to the eldest son of the Duke of uh, you know, uh, Hampshire. He goes, in what sense are they born equal? I can't think of any. He said, you know, their life chance, life skills, life opportunity. No, no, no. He said, what you mean is, wouldn't it be good if we worked towards a world where there was more equal opportunity, blah, blah. And he goes, yes, 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 yes. But the language of human rights makes it seem like that's the world you live in now. Wrong, says Bentham. So he's making a claim that you you have a better chance of reforming the world along lines that you'd like if you actually were a little more accurate in what you were saying. I think he's right on that, actually. Um, so Bentham's claim was always that the language of human rights actually leads to weird outcomes, where proponents of human rights actually end, actually end up being harsher than people who are sort of more legal positivists or Benthamite. I can think of a perfect example um, today. I think he's right on things like all sorts of things related to criminal law. But just think of this. A lot of human rights people said, 
waterboarding in the UK in the US was torture. Now, there's a lot of debatable lines about this. You can argue, uh, you know. But here's the odd thing that's come out of it. The Obama administration, in a sense, um, could not do that. And so what happens? You find President Obama ordering drone strikes and killing people all over the place in northern Pakistan. That's OK. And you end up being, in fact, harsher because it's just so difficult to interrogate people that he can't really do it. And there's no way he was going to do anything other than knock off Osama, in my view, because they have no scope. They've limited the scope for any sort of plausible interrogation. They just can't do it anymore. And so the Benthamite point is, look, this absolutist moralized thinking ends up making you a harsher person in a weird kind of way. You're more prepared to order drone strikes than people who say, well, I'd like to pull them out and you know, waterboard them, which in effect makes them think they're being drowned. But it's hard to see how pretending to drown someone is, is a worse thing than actually killing them. So you get these weird outcomes. I'm not saying they're always those sort of outcomes, but that's the sort of Bentham claim. Um, so as I said, the language of human rights sometimes conflates two ideas. The is claim about the world, which is a legal claim, and the ought claim. You know, it's Hume that said you can't derive an ought from an is. People do it all the time, by the way, but you, you can't logically do that. So I agree that the language, the idea of human rights can be a very potent and powerful and clear force for good. It absolutely can. But on the other hand, it can obscure clear thinking. I think it can. It can impede needed reforms. It can. It can constrain democratic decision making. It does that all the time in favor of a sort of aristocratic decision making where you know, yesterday's lords are replaced by today's judicial elite. You know, Walter Badgett, the great British sort of constitutional and political theorist, he said, the most melancholy of human reflections is that on the whole, it's a question whether the benevolence of mankind does more harm or good. And I think that applies to a lot of the sort of um, today's self-styled human rights advocates. Um, so if you remember and never forget that in Western liberal democracies today, people disagree about almost any important social issue. I mean, Jeremy Waldron's career is built on just saying that. People disagree, and it's reasonable. And you can't say one side is in need of re-education, because it's always the other side. No one ever says, my view on abortion is the one that's uh, completely bonkers, and I need to be re-educated, because they're so right. You never say that. Um, so with those foundations, uh, there's a whole bunch of various tangents you could go off on. I'll just name them. I won't do it. But um, one possibility would be to show that you can value and support rights, uh, again, which are just rules, which are just others must claim, without also thinking that a Bill of Rights is a good way to do it. Just about everybody in a Western democracy is in favor of rights. The real argument is how you ought to protect them. And a Bill of Rights is just one of many options. And it's one that really has enervating effects on democratic decision making, not because democratic decision making is perfect, but because it's the least bad system going. And you only have to look at the cynicism about politics in US and Canada now. I mean, there's this view that people only vote their pocketbooks. You know, the only reason people go into the ballot box is to get a better deal from government. I don't actually buy that. There's an awful lot of people who vote on value-based lines. And you can't really understand the Green Party. Um, people in the states vote about abortion. There's all sorts of reasons people vote. And if you take those issues off the table and say, well, you don't get a say on that, as Waldron always points out, they're not likely to want to vote. Um, so one possibility then is to go and start looking at the empirical facts about who del better delivers the goods. And I don't think there's very many specific issues where you can say, you know, Australia really lags behind Canada or the UK. As I said, if you look at um, anti-terrorism laws after 2001, Australia looks good compared to the UK. Or if you look at free speech issues, we look good compared to Canada specifics. We don't look as good as the US, but the US have has immense protection of free speech. I like that, actually. But you know, it's, it's a formalized thing. I spend a semester at Cornell Law School, and the Americans are amazing. Campus, the self-censorship on American university campuses is incredible. They just don't say anything controversial. It's amazing. Um, a second thing, you could go on and look at this issue in terms of the rebirth of natural law. So in the last 60 years, this whole way of thinking of the world, the rebirth of, say, um, all of the uh, UN human rights documents or American constitutional law type thinking. It's just a rebirth of natural law, the kind of thing that Bentham attacked in the early 1800s and basically died outside of the US for 150 years. There were no natural law thinkers outside the US. 
And even in the US, there weren't all that many. And it's just since the end of the Second World War, you know, it seems to be the default assumption of just about everyone. But I don't think it's any more plausible now than it was 100 years ago. Um, you can go and look at whether uh, the sort of untempered absolutist human rights thinking actually has good consequences. And Bentham's view is it doesn't always, and I think he's probably right on that to some extent. You could look at uh, the state of Victoria, say, with its statutory bill of rights. And uh, their statutory bill of rights has the typical guarantee of free speech. It's section 15. And you can wonder, and this was in the paper a couple weeks ago, you can wonder why between 2006 and the middle of 2008, Victoria's judges issued 627 gag orders against the media. New South Wales, bigger state, no Bill of Rights, they issued 54. You never hear that from Bill of Rights advocates. Where is the benefit of this thing? Well, I mean, I, it's true that in the UK there's, what, three textbooks a week being published by legal academics on the Human Rights Act, so it's a benefit to us. <laughs> and, you know, I have this sideline niche business attacking Bills of Rights. You know, Bills of Rights have been great for me because there's only about a handful of us who oppose bills of rights. We can't travel on the same plane. But um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not clear where the benefits of these things are. If you were really provocative, you could also point out that this underlying disdain that you see for the views of the ordinary voter, at this Amnesty International thing last night, we have to educate people. We have to teach these people. You know, and it just gets tedious after a while, this disdain that's so easily glossed over by sort of vapid references, you hear it all the time, to the tyranny of the majority. Well, if you actually ask people, what do you, I'd like you to cash that idea out. What do you mean by the tyranny of the majority? It cannot mean that every time you lose on some public policy issue, the other side is part of a tyranny of the majority. If you live in a democracy, you are going to lose sometimes. You cannot expect to be on the winning side of every issue you care about. You cannot expect to be on the winning side of every rights-related issue you care about. Because there's 22 other million other people in society. And so when people talk about the tyranny of the majority, leave aside the fact that historically, the minority's done a much better job of tyranny. Tyranny of the minority is a very scary thing. The majority doesn't do tyranny very well. You know, they're not shooting people and torturing them nearly as well as the minority. But leaving that aside, for it to make any sense, and Waldron's pointed this out, tyranny of the majority has to mean there's some identifiable group in society and they always lose. They lose on every issue going. It's not that they lose on you know, abortion, but they win on you know, euthanasia, or they win on this, and they, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. Tyranny of the majority has to mean there's some identifiable group that loses and loses and loses and loses. The only plausible example we can think of in the West probably is the blacks in the US South in the 50s, 40s. It might look like tyranny of the majority there. Um, but as people like um, uh, Mark Tushnet have said, he's just moved up to Harvard, or uh, Larry Kramer, when you actually look at cases like um, uh, Brown v. Board of Education, um, it doesn't really cash out in terms of a tyranny of the majority because at the time, a majority of whites were in favor of desegregation. It was a federalism problem that in the South, the whites were against, but the vast majority of whites in the US wanted to desegregate. Or even Roe v. Wade doesn't cash out as a tyranny of the majority. You know, abortion in the US is a 50-50 proposition. 5149, that's not tyranny of the majority. It's a borderline call. So it's hard to think of an example where there's actually been a tyranny of the majority and the judges have rescued, you know, ridden to the rescue of the minority. You know, Brown v. Board of Education didn't do much. The simple fact, as Tushnet said, it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act in 63 and the Civil Rights Act of 65 that really you got real change. So, and those were pieces of legislation. So, you know, I'm always sort of a little bit uneasy when people start showing this disdain for the average voter. And it was the average voter that gave women the vote. It was the average voter that delivered uh, Aboriginal people the same entitlements as everyone else. The, av the average voter has got a pretty good history in the West. And until about 20 years ago, left-wing parties were the parties that pushed for um, more and more democracy. One of the interesting things for a lot of I think as a political critique is that left-wing parties in many parts of the West have just lost their confidence in the voter, the average voter. They've been captured by a sort of lawyer-like progressive elite and it's killing them, I think, because they just don't really have confidence in your average voter anymore. Um, something I find incredibly distasteful. But it's that sort of puffed up, we know better than everyone else. It oozes out of so many um, people. Just have to turn on the ABC and listen to just what anyone interviewed. So 
you know, I, I could go through how fundamentally undemocratic and anti-democratic so much international law is. So, you know, when you start actually reading about international law, leave aside that um, treaties never go through the legislature. One of the good things about the U.S. is you have to actually put it through the legislature and get two-thirds of the Senate to agree. We do it under the prerogative power. You know, the executive is making treaties. And then when you look at how it relates to federalism and the fact that the executive can make a treaty and then they can use some bizarre treaty to say you can't build the dam in Tasmania, it just kills federalism. It's incredibly undemocratic. Um, or aspects of international law that aren't treaty related. So the sort of customary international law, what does that mean? People throw it around. It means that a bunch of law professors, and you have to be judged to be sound. It's hard to believe, but true. So if you're a skeptic about international law, you don't count. It's like a club. They can make these customary sort of case law type views and tell us what international law is. You could not sit down and create a less democratic vehicle of lawmaking than customary international law. You, it wouldn't be possible. Um, and you know, if you look at Section 128 constitutional referenda in Australia, and people go, oh, you know, it's so hard to change the constitution in Australia. It's not hard to change the constitution in Australia. Compared to Canada, it's dead easy. You get half the voters in the country, and then your little bargain with federalism, the voters in half the state, over half the states. Well, compare that to Canada. For some aspects of Canada's constitution, you need every province to agree. It will never happen. You can't get rid of the queen in Canada without Prince Edward Island agreeing. It has 100,000 people out of 33 million. You know, or the American constitution. They are immensely harder to change than Australia's constitution is not hard to change. What's happened is every time you ask the voters, 38 times out of 44 or something like that, they say no. Well, I first got to Australia, I flipped through those referenda. You know what? I think I would have voted with the voters on almost every single one of them. There's hardly a referendum that we have asked that's been to extend democracy or to extend federalism. They're all about centralizing. They're all about less federalism. And I actually think the voters got them right on almost every one. The one time they did say, do you want to extend democracy to aboriginals in 67, it passed. And so people are very negative about it. But it's always the same people. And the referenda questions aren't very good. Even on the republic, and I'm a totally non-emotional constitutional monarchist. If you show me a better system, I vote for it. But come on, it's very hard to design a better system. That's the point. Our system works great with a head of state who's just cutting ribbons and visiting hospitals and hasn't got a view on anything. And I don't know how you recreate that. You know, it's not good when your governor general has to make a once in 100 years call on who to put into government and her daughter's married to a cabinet minister in the Labor Party. It's not very good. Um, but really, that doesn't come up very often. So there's so many problems with designing a replacement that if you're a hard-nosed consequentialist like me, you know, I could see myself voting for a constitutional monarchy for 100 years. Because no, I don't see how you're going to design something better. But show it to me. I'm, I'm open-minded. Anyway, those are a whole bunch of tangents. Just let me conclude this way. A right is a rule. It's as simple as that. The right can be a legal one where the origin and source is clear. It comes from statute. It comes from a bunch of cases. It comes from a constitutional provision that's been glossed, and refined. You can disagree about its desirability, but you know where its source comes from. Um, alternatively, a right can be a rule that's a moral claim. The source of those sorts of claims are highly contestable, highly contestable. And not only is the source contestable, its desirability is contestable. So the language of human rights conflates those two sorts of rights and rules. Bentham, a couple centuries ago, said you've got to keep them separate. You've got to keep the legal is claim and the non-legal ought claim separate. And the language and absolutist inclinations of human rights thinking prefers to conflate and blend the two together. And you know, when Bentham said that sort of blending of the two claims together has bad long-term consequences in terms of human welfare, I think on balance he got it right. Um, and it, a lot of that sort of thinking ties into whether you want a Bill of Rights. So I'll finish there. Take questions. Anybody got any questions? Yes? Jim, um, is, is there much perspective work being done on, I suppose, a, a human rights order comparatively between Australia and other countries who say in relation to freedom of speech that the Australians would be very good compared to some other European countries? Well, it's, it's good from the point of view of someone who wants as much scope as possible to speak your mind. But I mean, there's an awful lot of people who want to you know, prosecute Andrew Bolt and have very vigorous hate speech laws, and they wouldn't like that. So I mean, I, when I say good, I mean, from my point of view of wanting, I mean, I just think in a democracy, you have to have a thick skin. And if 
you don't like what someone says, you just reply. But that's not the view of a lot of people. So if you want constraints on what people can say, and I did this thing at the Wheeler Center, and the people who were arguing in favor of hate speech laws said they're in, you know, they said they were proponents of the right to free speech. Because their meaning of a right to free speech is, is lots of limits on the right to free speech. It's sort of bizarre. So you always have to say, well, what do you mean? You know? Well, my question is because I, in the past, I've worked in front of the law school, and I've certainly been touched by that I started off by slamming these national professors and then giving them free thought and free work for us and doing some work. And then I thank my friends who stood with me in the Bill of Rights and friends who had a good understanding of what the national picture and the council is and what the law is. So we got to the common. That's my test, yeah. but that's not an absolutist type thing. Yeah, and I think you'd have to be a bit careful how you did it, because what you tend to get, George Williams does this all the time, is he focuses on one particular thing and says it's better in Canada. But you know, it's a comparative thing. It's the whole package. And you have to go in admitting that people are going to disagree about hate speech or um, you know, exactly how you want to deal with uh, criminal procedure or search and seizure. But how do we look compared to people we want to be compared against? We don't want to be compared to Zimbabwe, but we might like to be compared to, I think we look good compared to the UK, US, and Canada. Do we look as good as New Zealand? Maybe not. New Zealand's got a, but New Zealand's in a particularly unusual situation. They don't really have to worry about stuff post 9-11. You know, they've got the advantage of basically having no armed forces because they're so far away. And, and, and so they, you know, but of course, New Zealand's the most parliamentary sovereignty place left on the planet. So if, you're, if New Zealand's your model, you know, they, their judges have even probably less scope because there's no constitution to interpret. Jim, I was, I was intrigued by your, um, the, the, the stuff that you thought was And then I was intrigued by your uh, comment at the end that you support a constitutional monarchy. And I sort of thought that Simon Jeffrey and Guy Mitchell were opposed to it. Well, I mean, democracy, it sort of, it's as what did Badge say as the real functioning thing. I mean, we live in a system where, you know, the, the monarch and the governor general has no real power, zero. Um, so if it bothers you that the nominal head of state who has no power to do anything except once in 100 years decide who gets the first crack at government, um, well, then you have to say, well, okay, well, what, what system are you going to deliver? Are you going to deliver a system where you take a Westminster system and you try to shove it into an American model without the checks and balances, where you have an elected president who really will have a lot of power? You just cannot think that an elected president who decides to have a view on abortion is not going to be taken more seriously than a, a governor general who's, you know, got no credibility. And in fact, so I think the beauty of the system you could never design of a constitutional monarchy is your head of state, no one takes him or her seriously. And so I don't see where, how that undermines democracy. We know that the people making the calls are the prime minister and cabinet. The governor general's not making any calls at all that I can see. And when she opens her mouth, she's not doing her job. You know, it's, so if you could design a system where you just open the phone book and pick somebody's name out of a hat, I don't think they could do it. I mean, what, what do you have to do to be governor, general? Nothing. You don't have any um, problems with Simon Jeffrey as a nation. I mean, uh, the idea of common Well, it's a constitutional monarchy. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you said, OK, well, now that William and Kate are married, the, it's the first kid, OK. I mean, I, mean I, I quite like, as a Canadian who's never going to get rid of the constitutional monarchy because it's written into our constitution, you can't change it in effect now. Um, well, I mean, I like it better in Australia and Canada because we don't have to pay for it. I mean, it's a really cheap system. They visit once in a blue moon. I mean, anyone who says it's expensive just doesn't know what you pay to have a president. So we get this sort of bargain. We don't really do anything. Um, you know, I wasn't, you know, my wife was watching the wedding, and 
I didn't really sit down and watch it until I saw the sister, which point, <laughs> which point I sat down and watched it for a while. But um, you know, and then I, I watched the rest of it. But uh, you know, but so I think that attracts people. But um, you know, it's it's a system that works immensely well. That's why it's so hard to change. If it didn't work well, we'd have got rid of it a long time ago. Um, if you were in the UK, you might say, well, is it worth getting rid of a thousand years of history? It is the and nobody. When you talk about a monarchy, you know it's the British one everyone's talking about. But those those things don't matter to me. It, I mean, I've traveled. It doesn't bother me that the head of state is nominally from a different country because once you know the facts, the head of state really doesn't matter, does it? The Queen's not making the call on who who gets to form the first government. The Governor General's making the call. The Queen doesn't do anything. So I don't know. I, I mean, the, there's I, I I suspect that the real argument on the monarchy is to a large extent determined by, you know, the sort of moral sentiments you bring to the table. So if you're an Irish Catholic, you're inclined to be against no matter what. And if you're someone who fought in the Second World War, you're English, you're inclined to be in favor. But the hard-nosed, cold-hearted look at it, it's hard to design a system that's better. And I, I, I say that, you know, some way. I mean, some people will say, I don't care if it's better. I just want to get rid of it. I don't think like that. Well, you should talk to Tom Campbell. All oh, right, yes, right. Um, one thing I found interesting is you're talking about when you started off, you said about uh, self-righteousness. Thinking that people get up very self-righteous about the sort of moral issues at the time. But of course, that's a neutral thing. Both sides sure. of heated arguments feel that. Uh, how, what are the <coughs> sort of processes? I think I get the sense that in a lot of issues nowadays, there's an increasing success of increasing polarization and self-righteousness because positions held very firmly without room to move or debate. And what are the best processes, other than a human rights bill, to try to get overcome those intransigent positions where people, where two opposed groups have such intransigent positions, fundamentally to be held uh, extreme perhaps in some respects? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm giving my game here away a bit, but you know, I, I did a moral philosophy PhD on Hume. Hume have led into the consequentialists. I'm a sort of a utilitarian consequentialist. So utilitarians like to look at the moral world, and they like to say, what's likely to have the best consequences? So they try to take moral issues and turn them into questions of fact. So people will change their mind based on facts. You know, if you say an independent central bank's not a good idea, and loads of people did 20 years ago, and after you see how it works out, you know, almost everyone says having an independent central bank is a good idea now, because the facts are overwhelming, inflation comes down, et cetera. So if you can take moral issues about, say, the one-child policy in China and translate them into a question of fact, well, you know, you'll still disagree, but over time, you're going to convince people. Um, if, you, if you have a disagreement that's couched in extremely moralized, abstract terms, I mean, have you ever, do you know anyone who's ever had an argument in moral terms, and in the middle of the argument, they go, you know what, you've completely convinced me. I've changed my worldview. You're right. You know, I tell my class, if that's ever happening, here's a 100% guarantee. One of them wants to date the other one. <laughs> it is the only explanation for that. It never happens. Um, so be very wary if someone says you've changed my entire world view over in the course of a conversation. You do get people to change their minds when you tr and you translate the argument into uh, what, are, what are the facts of this going to play out as? Um, you know what's going to happen if we move to a regime of civil union? And let's try it. We'll be federalists. We'll try it. We'll see what happens. See if you know things collapse or they don't. People change their minds. It happens all the time. But if you keep it couched in the most sort of abstract and apocalyptic terms, nobody changes their minds. I think that's the problem. Um, but, but these both groups have an interest in categorizing women. They, they I don't know if they have an interest. I think that's just a trend since the end of the Second World War. I think it's the problem with natural law thinking. Yeah. Everyone yeah. wants to couch things in the most unbelievably moralized terms. It's not very good. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a, if you have a, I mean, the, the Victorian government introduced the charter. Well, it was a democratic process in the sense that uh, yeah, so they right they won they won the election. Yeah. Um, it wasn't. Yeah, and now the current <coughs> government is is thinking about getting rid of it. That's just more democracy. Well, I think so. I mean, it was a democratic process, but it was dressed up in you know they had this little 
commission where they brought in George Williams from another state, uh, sure. and they didn't appoint a single skeptic or opponent. They did have a very good basketball player, Andrew Gaze. I don't know what he brought to the table. <laughs> That's a very good jump so shot I, from about 25 feet. You could level the same criticism of the current inquiry, even though there's... Uh, sure. Except that in, this, in the current inquiry, there's four members of the coalition and three of the Labor Party, so they're actually represented three out of seven yeah, versus none out of six. Yeah, you that's know, a fair so. point. But, I mean, in a sense, they're both examples of democracy at work. Sure, but you, so there can't be a rule that you can't repeal something you don't like when you win an election, right? Well, of course. You, yeah, there can't be that. Temporal equivalence. Yeah. So if, if people decide to pass a statute that, can, that refers these abstract moral issues to courts, which they can review, but sure. that's not something they want to do for a period of time. They can't really well, no, you can't. I mean, if it's a constitutional bill, you might make a Waldron-like argument. And Waldron says, look, you have to distinguish between the process for getting you something, and that can be democratic, and the outcome. So Waldron said, if you voted for a sort of a clergy-led government or you voted for a dictatorship, the process would be democratic, but what you got wouldn't be. Yeah. It, what you get doesn't become democratic just because you get there by a democratic process. Let me just get this straight. The, I mean, the Victorian model, um, when the Court of Appeal makes a declaration of incompatibility, yeah. that goes back to the Parliament, and it's taken yeah. to Parliament for a period of time. So Parliament gets, a, if you like, a second bite of the cherry, and if they decide that they want to um, uh, change the legislation or not, then it's on the Correct. Constitution. So there's more democracy. Well, I mean, I, then you get into this empirical question of, of what will happen now. There's been 26 declarations in the UK, and the legislature's caved every single time. Canada has a Section 33 notwithstanding. Since 1982, the legislature um, has never used it federally, not once. Now, Jeff Goldsworthy's argument, and I think it's pretty persuasive, is the way you're characterizing the disputes makes it hard for the legislature. So when you read Section 33 or you read these declarations, here's what happens. You've got some highly contestable rights-related issue, and the judges will decide that four to three. And then that will be deemed to be the rights-respecting outcome. And then we will leave the legislature with the power to say, we're going to take your rights away. They're not left with the power to say, look, this was a highly debatable call. By four to three majority, you judges think X. But by 122 to 120, we think not X. That might be a usable power. But the only power you leave the legislature in Victoria is to say, OK, well, now that we know what the rights-respecting outcome is, on cross-examining rape complainants or whatever, or exclusion of evidence, we're going to take your rights away. And because of the way it's characterized, Goldsworthy says you can't really use it. And nobody wants to be characterized as taking your rights away. What they'd like to say is, you know, you guys are wrong about this. The more rights-respecting outcome is to say, yes, you can, you can limit someone's cross-examination of a rape complainant. But they don't get to say that. Now, that's a fairly sophisticated argument. But the fact is that you can't point to one declaration power where the legislature has ever stood up to the judges. So you know, I keep waiting for it to happen in Canada. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with Monsilovich, which is now at the high court. They haven't issued the ruling yet. But um, you get these. If it were a national statutory bill of rights, you'd have real questions about whether the declaration power is a problem with separation of powers. Because it's a state bill of rights, it has been argued. If you read the trend, they have argued that it's a separation of powers problem because it's going up to the high court. So even though it's a state matter, they should be able to do it because the high court's having to do it. And so, I mean, as a Canadian, I've, you know, I've never encountered the whole separation of powers type thinking until I got here. I find it bizarre. I don't really see the benefit of the separation of powers argument. So, I mean, that makes me an apostate. But it certainly seems plausible to me that it would be a real problem with a not because I think it should be a problem, but given the jurisprudence, it could be a problem if you had a, a Brennan National Bill of Rights that had a declaration power. It, could have, it looks like a problem on separation of powers grounds. And you notice all the ex-High Court judges split. Yeah. Everyone split. Nobody agrees. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly a potential problem. It should be not a problem at the state level, unless you buy the argument that because High Court judges have to interpret it, it becomes a problem. And we'll find out. I mean, I, don't know, I wouldn't want to bet on it either way. My colleague, Suri, seems to think that they'll let it go, the judges. But I don't know. It's like, I don't know. Jared probably has a better idea than I do. I don't know how they're going to come. No. Any final question? Well, Christian, thanks in again for your service. Give your life. For more information, visit bond.edu.au forward slash iTunes U.